Fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Stephen and I are going to attempt to kick this thing off. Um, this is uh, the Digital Audio Focus Group. Um, we have not come up with a more entertaining name yet. Um, we are taking submissions. So if you have a brilliant idea for something that sounds less pedestrian um, or more evocative, um, uh, your contributions are welcome. You can put them in the chat. Um, we will have a drawing for, uh, for the submissions. Uh, I can't promise that what you'll get from that drawing will be anything that you want, but it'll be something that we do anyway uh, because random numbers are fun. Um, cool. Uh, so what we wanted to do tonight, uh, Steve and I have been, and Steve have been great. We've been chatting back and forth over the last couple of weeks, really excited about putting something together. What we decided was that the industry is not very decided on what to call these damn things that we're putting in our houses or that that, that uh, the industry uh, is commercially making available to us. Um, there's all kinds of different names for things. And so we thought we'd settle on um, some common terminology, uh, common to us, maybe not common to the rest of the industry, um, that tries to describe what things are. So when you're on internet forums or you're chatting amongst yourselves um, and, and people bring up these different terms, you'll have some idea of what we're talking about. The reason it's necessary is because um, the composition of our audio systems is changing quite a bit, right? I mean, years ago, you had a source and you had an amplifier and you had speakers. Maybe it was a turntable, maybe you got a cassette deck or whatever. And we kind of all knew what those things were and they had names and they made sense. Um, speakers were all passive back in the day, so there wasn't anything complicated there. Um, CD players, um, when they finally came around, had DACs in them, so we didn't need to worry about what a DAC was and all those things. But now we've got things that are all split apart or you've got speakers with DACs built into them. And, and um, I mean, the, the way that you can build a system, the number of combinations and permutations is, is kind of crazy right now around the digital side of things. Um, and it's only gonna get more interesting, I think, as time goes on. You look at the CAF LS50 Wireless 2 that just came out a little while ago, um, uh, makes some significant improvements on the previous model, but it, it kind of is an entire stereo system all by itself. Um, if that sounds familiar, I mean, we had all-in-one systems back in the, well into the previous century, um, console systems or whatever. And so in some ways, history repeats itself, um, but with very different technology and different uh, substrates. Um, and so, um, so we'll touch on some of those things. Um, a lot of people who already have existing systems are trying to figure out how to add digital to your existing system. And do you need to like to start from scratch and just check it all? Um, or is there, are there kind of ways that you can adapt what you already have? Um, to to make it kind of streaming and digital aware. We'll talk about some of that stuff uh, throughout this series. Um, the format that we decided on, because um, listening to a couple of nerds uh, yammer on for hours and hours may not be everybody's cup of tea, at least, uh, at least um, that was kind of what our focus group told us. Um, what we decided to do was, was break the sessions up into roughly three parts. So at the beginning, um, just to kind of get a common base of knowledge across to everybody about what we're talking about and so that nobody's lost in the discussion, um, at least for the first few of these, we're going to spend um, roughly the first third of the meeting kind of going over terminology and ideas and concepts and that kind of stuff. Some of you guys will already be well versed in all this stuff. Uh, it'll be second nature. Um, you can just pull out your iPad and surf the internet or whatever. Um, and then you know, maybe poke up if, if it sounds like we're misspeaking and say, hey, you said something wrong or we can have a debate later. But um, generally speaking, we're going to try to provide some primer or some background information for the first third. The second third, um, we want to talk a little bit about music um, or we'll do some audio show and tell. There are a couple of people who put in survey responses saying, hey, I'd really like to see um, or hear about what other people are doing in their systems um, since we can't get together at each other's houses all that much. Um, we'll invite uh, one or two members of this group um, in a subsequent meeting to, to show us some of the things that they put together. Um, we've got some things that we'll share with you from our own systems right now to kind of kick things off. Um, but we'll talk about music. We'll talk a little bit about gear, but, um, you know, really just try to, you know, to bring in some component of this that is uh, an explanation for why we're all here in the first place. Um, uh, the fun thing about digital music is, um, that you know, if, if I have a, an album that I've discovered over the last week that's really interesting, um, and we're all on some kind of streaming service, um, we can do some kind of social listening, right? I, I can say, hey, 
um, check this album out, here's a link to it. And then like five minutes later, you can be listening to it in full resolution in your system. You don't have to go out to a store. You don't have to wait for elusive disc or somebody else to send you an album. Um, and then we can get on chat later on or while you're listening and, and compare notes. What did we hear in that, in that new giant steps remaster, for example, what, you know, right. how is it different from the six and a half dozen other different copies and releases that you've bought over the course of your audiophile career? Uh, we can compare notes in real time. There's no, um, you know, there's kind of no barriers to that kind of stuff. So pretty cool. Um, we'll try to leverage that, um, that capability that we have that's unique to digital in that second part. Um, we may not do a lot of listening here in this forum just because audio and you Zoom kind of sucks, um, but we'll be able to talk about it and you'll be able to listen to what we're playing um, almost immediately after. The third part will be kind of a, 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 a question and answer type of session. We've got a lot of questions that have come in. I'm sure there'll be more. Um, we want to structure this this way instead of trying to answer questions in line because I think um, in a Zoom format, things get a little bit confusing. And then as well, if you've only got an hour to spend with us and you miss out on the Q&A, you know, you can, um, you can watch that part later or maybe you don't have any questions, um, you know, you can, you can follow up with us af offline. Um, but for those who can stick around, if you want to um, ask us some questions, uh, ask us anything you want. Um, and we'll make up answers. Um, all right, does that sound good? Yep. All right, I see some heads nodding, very good. Um, heads bobbing and audio is always a good thing. I'm going to attempt to share my screen without going back in time, so please hang on. Share. All right, presumably you see something. Um, I can only see a portion of you now, which makes me sad, but I see one enormous thumb that is upraised and I take that as a very good sign. All right, so uh, with that, we'll get started. Uh, digital audio lexicon, uh, for lack of a better term, um, we decided to come up with some words. We're not gonna cover a whole ton of things here. Um, we had grand ambitions, but we put, I think, some of the most useful explanations in here. And then we have a lot of examples of different kinds of gear. Um, I think people who are interested in kinds of gear types of things. So we have a lot of examples and we'll share out this whole deck. So don't worry, you'll get a copy of this thing that you can look at later on. Don't feel like you have to write everything down unless that helps you in some way. Um, but we'll share some links of current products that you can research on your own that are examples of the things that we're talking about just to kind of get, um, get your uh, juices flowing. You may see some of the gear that you've already purchased in the list. You may see some things that are worth considering down the road. Um, I have experience with a tiny fraction of these, um, but uh, anybody else who has played around with these things uh, can comment when we get to the Q&A section. Um, so uh, some housekeeping things. I think we've already covered this, but um, uh, we want to, uh, like I said, save uh, Q&A till the end. Um, and then uh, record your questions in Zoom chat um, and we'll try to um, kind of feather those into the Q&A session as we go. Um, if something is, is earth, earth shattering or wrong, um, shout out and, uh, and we'll uh, try to address those. But for the most part, we'll try to save that stuff to the uh, Q&A section. Um, so names are hard. Um, for those not familiar with this ancient painting, it's, I guess, Adam trying to name all the animals. Um, uh, I guess he did okay. But um, it's really kind of the first step in learning about something new. Um, if, you can, if you can have some concepts and some names that you can pin uh, those two together, uh, that really kind of is the foundation for understanding and then certainly being able to communicate with other people about that. And so um, it's kind of what we wanted to try to cover today. So um, uh, Stephen, I'll let you cover this slide. Uh, okay. I think you've got a good a good concept of um, the history of digital audio, and then I'll uh, I've talked long enough, and so um, I'll, okay. I'll pick up afterwards. Okay, so I I just wanted to kind of start with some basic foundation, just to kind of level set you know the gang on you know where all this came from. I'm hoping you can see this this yeah it looks like it's cropped here. David, do you know how we could uncrop the slide by any chance? You know what yeah, I'm just yeah, gonna. Yeah. I'm just going to speak. Let's. I'm just going to speak to it, guys. So just kind of listen. I think if you resize your window, maybe it can uncrop it. I don't know. Uh, let's see here. Uh, view options. Uh, let's go to uh, fifty percent. No, it's for some reason it's still cropped uh, in Zoom. Uh, I, I think we have a form an aspect ratio problem with respect to um, this. I'm just going to read the slide, you guys. Don't worry about the crop thing. We'll figure that out next time. All I'm right. Gonna yeah. go, I'm going to go through the slides and just kind of read um, the slides that we have in Google Docs. So, uh, and we'll send this deck out for you as well. Um, 
but I'll just read it, read it out for you guys. I'll let David maybe figure out the slide deck. But you know, where did all this stuff start? Actually, uh, uh, Foundations for Digital Audio started back in the 30s. Um, uh, it was invented at Bell Labs in the 30s, and you guys have probably heard of of, uh, of um, uh, Linkwitz, and uh, he was actually looking at improving uh, Morse code telephony. And you know, Morse code telephony is actually a digital form of communication. Uh, you've got dots and dashes, zeros and ones. Uh, and of course, you know, so a lot of the theory for this was laid down in the 30s and 40s. Um, David has got a link in our slide deck for uh, 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 an AES paper that kind of talks about the dawn of digital you guys can refer to after the meeting. But we're kind of aware, those that are old enough and been around long enough, you know, we kind of remember back in the late 70s, you know, we heard about Sony kind of introducing some new functionalities for digitizing music and making music available digitally. They developed a methodology called post, pulse code modulation that allowed for the sampling of music in an, an encoded form that was representative of the analog music that we had at the time, our, our tapes, you know, either our reel-to-reel -reel tapes or uh, LPs or cassettes, right? Uh, and primarily PCM has been, is, is by far the predominant format for digitally encoded music. If you kind of did a statistical analysis, you'd see it's probably 95% of all of the content in the world is PCM. But of course, many of you are familiar with that, that Sony also developed a format called DSD, uh, which they originally uh, put out on SACD. Is this another form of, of encoding music? Um, so it started in the 70s. Uh, Philips and Sony started working together to kind of define the original format that that digital music uh, would be kind of um, uh, displayed on. Uh, David, you can go to, uh, let's see, uh, slide six, I guess. That's All kind right. of where I'm, where I'm talking about here. Um, yeah, that's good, right there. Uh, and so, um, you know, this is just a list of kind of the different forms that have kind of come about over the years in terms of, you know, our digital music content. Uh, the first was the, the, what you guys have heard is Redbook CD. Uh, you may not know the story, but it's called Redbook because the original document, the specifications, engineering specifications document that was jointly co-developed by Sony and Philips in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, uh, was a red book. It was literally a red uh, binder. Red of, binder, yeah. A red binder. And that's where the name Redbook came from. And that was the specifications, the engineering specifications for the development of this technology. And we've had other things like HDD, HDCD audio, DVD audio, DTS music discs, SACDs, which most of you are familiar with, Pure Audio Blu-ray, MQA, CD, you know, all this other stuff. But again, the vast majority of content available in the world is, is Redbook CD. Um, so what kinds of forms, you know, does our digital music uh, take in terms of how is it encompassed? Um, and as we kind of moved away from, from sl started to transition from physical media CDs that we put in a player, like David described, that player would have a disc, uh, a DAC in it, right? It would be kind of analogous to a, a cassette player, except it had a digital audio converter in it. We put the disc in, we would play it, we'd hook it to our integrated amp or a preamp or whatever, and we'd, we'd get music out of it. Um, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, right, people started um, um, ripping music and starting to share music files off of CDs, right? And you guys remember the whole licensing discussion rights about all of that stuff. And we had limited, you know, we had limited storage space in computers, right? Hard drives were expensive at the time, things like that. And so a number of different audio formats came out that, that um, had some level of compression so we could share these files and listen to them on our computers or, or um, uh, in some cases, uh, mobile devices, right? So we had lossy formats like MP3, uh, OGG, um, and we had uncompressed formats like WAV, which was originally developed by Microsoft, uh, AIFF, um, and DSF, DFF. Uh, were uncompressed formats, but those became predominant a bit later as storage space, that is hard drive space, became less expensive. And say so what most people use nowadays is what's called lossless compression, uh, certainly what I still use, and those formats are things like FLAC, ALAC, uh, which is Apple's version of FLAC, and WMA, WMA lossless. So we can kind of see as we move through the digital 
history timeline, right, we kind of had originally physical media. And then I would say in the late 90s, early 2000s, we started saying, hey, you know, can I, I can, I can rip these files off some sort of physical media, put them on my computer, right? And why would I want to have to always have a, have a CD player hooked up to my stereo when I want to listen to music? I just, I could have it on my computer and listen to it in various formats, like through my computer speakers or something like that. And that's where we started to see these different file formats start to become existent, you know, around the, the beginning of the 2000s or so. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with with certainly with MP3s, that was a format that Apple used when they started coming out with iTunes. Some of you may remember Sound Jam, which was, I think, the first kind of ripper software that iTunes was based off of. It let you rip off of discs and things like that, and it created MP3s. Uh, and then um, we, we have kind of the formats that most of you use today, FLAC or ALAC, uh, as the way that most of our digital music is used with respect to a server. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. I remember it was really quite remarkable when I when I first went through the exercise of ripping a reasonable percentage of my music collection because I I had never really explored the music collection um, in a kind of a um, a, a, a non structured way. I, you know, just being able to see all the albums um, in a player and um, and and be able to navigate them and just switch from one album to the next immediately. I mean, I, I still spend quite a bit of time. Most of my listening sessions are listening to an album from start to finish. But a lot of times you'll, you'll just forget what music you have. I mean, I'm sure this has happened to most of us, right? Yep. After you have more than a thousand albums in your collection, like stuff just kind of gets buried in there and it goes, you goes years on years on listen to. Um, and if you have to go hunt for the disc, it could, it could go never listen to again. <laughs> Um, but being able to access all of that stuff and find it and search it is, is it's, it was just such a revelation, even though back then, you know, my first pass at all this stuff like many here was, uh, was some kind of lossy compression thing. Um, the, right. the, the kind of small hit to sound quality was, uh, was a small price to pay for being able to look at it in a, in a completely new way. Look at all the music that I'd acquired in a completely new way. Um, yeah, and, and then, you know, remember, digital music became easily portable around that time as well, right? Most of us have had an iPod at some point in time, right? You know, or we could put the music, you know, on a, a little hard drive. And, you know, I used to, when I would work in the lab at work, right, I would I would listen to music on my computer, my work computer by plugging in a little, a little hard drive or listening on my iPod. Or when I was out in the motorcycle, you know, I could plug my iPod into my my in-ear monitors and listen via the helmet, you know, and he's riding the motorcycle. So certainly the development of the iPod and MP3 and, you know, iTunes was a convergent technology that made digital music portable for the first time in an easily convenient and accessible way, right? And certainly the iPod drove a lot of that, you know, migrating away from physical media like CDs to file formats. Um, yeah, that portability was really the kind of killer application for all of this stuff. Um, what I think has um, escaped uh, audiophiles or kept a lot of us at arm's length for all of this stuff is, um, um, you know, really getting that sound quality that we expect from a system. If I'm going to sit down with a glass of wine or not in front of a pair of speakers with the lights dimmed and I'm going to give 100% of my attention to what I'm hearing, do I really want to hear this thing that um, historically has only been for convenience and portable use and on the go? Is it going to live up to my expectations? Am I going to be able to engage with the music um, uh, in a deep way um, when I'm use listening using a format that has traditionally just been all about convenience? And I think what, um, what I mentioned um, back in February as well when I did the talk with you guys, um, we've really kind of seen audio and digital especially um, Kind of turn the corner to the, and digital get, to get to the point where it can, um, with a bit of work, meet those expectations in the same way that we're accustomed to having those deep listening experiences with vinyl records or right. open reel tape or more traditional audio formats. It's taken digital a long, long time to kind of live, live up to the brand promise that we were sold back in the 80s when, uh, when CDs first became commercially available. I agree, absolutely. Uh, and for me, I remember the first time, just as a, a, a minor digression here, I remember the first time I actually bought a CD player was from a from a, a girlfriend that had bought a new one and I bought hers. And I was strictly a vinyl guy at that point and I plugged in her CD player and, and played a couple of the handful of CDs I had. And it sounded absolutely awful. It was horrible. Uh, and I didn't want to listen to it at all. Um, 
and I was thinking like, why do people want to listen to this? It was absolutely horrible. And this is kind of concomitant when, when Michael Fremer was kind of saying, hey, CDs don't sound that great. Let's, let, let's kind of stick with vinyl. Certainly we've had Michael out to visit as a guest for some of our things many times, right? And, you know, we certainly want to keep the vinyl aspect of things alive. Greg's doing, Gregory's doing a great job of that in the other focus group. But um, my first experience with digital in that format wasn't at all positive. And I think that just speaks to the point that David was making. Uh, even, even, you know, consumer grade CD players back then, you know, 20 plus years ago, um, 25 years ago were not impressive uh, for me anyway, at least the ones that I could afford. So I'm gonna kind of push on through here some of the, just cover the slide on, on digital file formats. Uh, you know, we've got um, two kind of attributes that kind of comprise file formats. There's sampling rate, which determines the bandwidth and bit depth, which determines dynamic range, but also I was watching a video that, that uh, David sent me to by a guy by the name of um, Monty, the other day, and it also uh, higher bit depths, like 24 bit, I'm sorry, uh, sampling rates also give you uh, like 96 kHz and above give you more uh, room for the application of the, 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 uh, the filter that's used for reconstructing the file format in terms of, of uh, not running into a brick wall with respect to uh, the filtering that's done when we recombine the numbers back into a, a, a form that we can actually listen to. So uh, that was one of the rationales for 96 K Hertz back in the day. Uh, and certainly 192 K Hertz is kind of the, the, uh, the um, sampling rate that many, much music has actually recorded now in studios. That's kind of the original sampling rate. And then we've got bit depth, uh, which is 16 or 24 bit. As a photographer, I kind of think of bit depth as, as you know, the bit depth of a photograph, it's comparable to music, you know, a, an 8-bit JPEG image doesn't have the number of colors available that you can see with your eye that a 10-bit a or a 12-bit or a 14 or 16-bit photograph has in terms of the range of colors. Music is the same way, certainly 24-bit has a much greater degree of bit depth and a dynamic range that can be recorded within uh, uh, um, the recording. And, and of course, this is, I think, one of the key things that started to get us to a place where people could listen to these recordings uh, uh, to some extent and feel like they had an experience that was comparable to a vinyl experience. Now, um, uh, again, David and I were just kind of talking about the fact that, that that's all well and good, but it doesn't, doesn't replace good mastering for audio quality for any digital recording as well. So, so the basic formats we have nowadays are Redbook 1644, uh, and then we've got other formats that are typically 2496, 24176, and 2492, uh, as well as DSD, which is its own thing. Um, and that's going to be kind of all I'm going to speak about that. Yeah, there are uh, a lot of debates about, you know, delivery format and what makes a lot of sense. Um, Steve and I were talking last week about how really some of the best sounding uh, material that we have in our collections, kind of bar none, certainly the case for me, um, on the digital side, and I'm only digital, so it's all of my sides, um, are the uh, Audio Wave XRCD24 discs, some of these things that I picked up from Elusive Disc. Um, they're mostly were jazz recordings from like kind of the golden era, 58 to 62 or something like that. They, they, they basically destroy pretty much any high-res thing that I've ever bought from HD tracks or anything else. And they're only 1644.1. One. Um, and the reason they destroy it is because, well, the performances are great, obviously, but um, the mastering uh, is, is incredible. Uh, the transfer is incredible. Um, and so as, as a delivery format, you know, you can ask the question legitimately, do we really kind of need more uh, more resolution, more uh, sampling no. rate than that. I'm, I'm, I'm in my 50s. Um, my hearing uh, stops, you know, just before 14 kilohertz for sure. There's nothing after that. So I don't need more bandwidth. Um, and the noise floor in my listening room, if, if planes aren't flying overhead, is probably somewhere in the um, high 30 dB to low 40 dB. And if I get much above 90 dB, it starts to get, you know, uh, tiresome to listen to. So I've got you know, maybe 50 dB of dynamic range in my room. Um, I don't know how many bits that's work, that works out to, but it's, it's definitely not 16, it's closer to six. Um, yeah. So I don't need the dynamic range either to kind of convey a full performance. The noise floor in my room is not low enough. 
Um, but I do need a great performance. I do need that great performance to be really well mastered. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we need to recognize. Now, it's absolutely true, like you said, that that um, uh, that higher sampling rates can be thought of as kind of a playback optimization. Maybe I have a DAC that has reconstruction mm -hmm. filters, and we can talk about this in a later session, but maybe my DAC has some filters. And, and one thing to know about filters is that they're all bad. There are no mm -hmm. great filters. Every filter destroys the music in one way or another. Um, but there are, the harsher the filters are, the steeper they are, the more they're asked to do, um, the worse they tend to be. And so if I can send my DAC a, um, a much wider bandwidth signal of, of, you know, at a higher sampling rate, then my DAC can use a more relaxed filter. So it can use, a, it'll yep. do less damage to the music when it, when it does the reconstruction than it would have done otherwise. And so um, don't get hung up about sampling rates as something that is going to convey more information. We're all, um, I, I doubt anybody here can hear above 20 kilohertz um, and certainly uh, not to 40 kilohertz. So um, it's not about the it's not about the bandwidth. It's just about um, feeding your DAC something that it likes, so that um, it, within the audio band that you can hear, um, those filters are doing the least harm. They will always do harm, but they'll do the least harm um, often at these higher sampling rates. And maybe at some point that'll all be solved, and it just completely won't matter. But um, until it does, that's something that's worth uh, worth paying attention to. All right, have we killed this one? Should we go to the next? Yeah, let's let's. I'm just going right. to kind. Of, I'm just going to kind of wrap up here in terms of kind of the some of the high level list of digital music components. Um, sorry that the slide is all schmush. We'll have to kind of format our slides in the future so they don't get crushed down like this. But you know, again, the first kind of digital components, right, were CD players. We remember those in the early part of the '80s coming out. Then we had SACD players. Uh, I would say about ten years ago, we started having universal disc players um, that would play CD you know, uh, SACD, HD, whatever, uh, Blu-ray. Uh, the Oppo is probably the, the one that most of us know the best, uh, that was probably the most widely adopted and the best performing of those. Uh, and of course, if you got super high end, like with Esoteric or some of the other manufacturers, right, you could get into the world of disc transports where you simply had a device that all it did was spin and read the disc, and then it would send that data to a DAC and then the DAC would do the D to A conversion, right? Um, and then of course we come to D to A converters, DACs that are, you know, the box now that does the D to A conversion is outside of the CD player, right? Again, with the presumption that the DAC that was in the CD player, you know, was built to a price point, there were compromises made and to buy your own standalone DAC, you could, if you could output like say from your Oppo to a DAC, you could get higher quality output. Uh, from a dedicated D to A converter. And of course, nowadays for, you know, folks that do a lot of streaming like David and I, whether it be from uh, files that are resonant on an external drive with respect to a music server or via streaming services, right? Uh, the DAC is primarily the, the, end, the, the destination from which all our music, you know, connects through to our amplification system. So, you know, we've got external DACs and I'm sure the, most of the folks here do as well. Um, then we start to see, I would say, uh, probably three or four or five years ago, uh, what I would call digital music players, right? The first one I remember was the Bryston BDP-1, uh, which was basically just a dedicated device where you could plug in like a thumb drive and it would play those music files back or you could hook up um, a CD player or various various sources uh, and then it would it would basically you know, I, I imagine reclock that information uh, and then send it to a DAC and make it sound better. Uh, and um, now we're seeing a convergence, and this is kind of some of the things we were talking about before we started formally tonight, where we see um, a convergence of a number of different functionalities into one device, uh, where the device may be what's called a network audio transport. It may have some sort of interface so it functions like some of the first streamers like the Logitech squeeze box or the Slim Devices Transporter. And it, it may also in some cases function as a DAC or, or in some cases it may be like a preamp or something like that. So we're seeing a real gamish of different devices being hybridized together into in some cases all in one solutions. Um, moving kind of down the ladder of abstraction uh, some of the things that we'll talk about sometime here in the future are a class of these called uh, network audio transport, so streamers uh, and network audio players, uh, and then renderers and network bridges. Um, 
Uh, and, and again, renderer and a network bridge, like the first uh, Sonora micro rendu was kind of the first one I know that hit the market back about uh, 2015, 16, I guess 2016. It, it was a renderer or an endpoint, but it was also function as a network bridge. Um, and then of course we've got music service, which we'll talk a little bit as, about as well, which is the computers that we use to kind of, you know, send our music files, uh, whether they be on a hard drive uh, or a streaming service to our, our, destina our digital destination. So I'm gonna let David transition over to the last couple, the couple other slides here, the next few slides. And, but one question, uh, where, yeah. where, where does an upsampler fit within that scheme you just described? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, like I said, the, the, what we're doing when we're upsampling, what we're usually trying to do is a playback optimization to feed the DAC whatever it wants. So, um, so you may have a DAC that's capable of a whole bunch of different sampling frequencies, but that works best at 24 or 192, for example. So if you can feed it that, then you'll be golden. Well, how many, what percentage of your music collection is 24, 192? If you're like me, it's probably, you know, less than 3% or something like that. So what do you do with all the rest of the stuff? Um, and so upsampling is a mathematically complex thing, tends to be at least to do it well. Uh, it's not something that some DACs will do internally. So um, you'll have DACs, I know that Benchmark famously has done this kind of thing. There are other uh, folks who do as well, like uh, PS Audio have um, a fancy VSD upsampling thing that's built into the firmware of their DAC. I think maybe Core do, um, iFi audio does. There are a bunch of people who will do that inside of the DAC. But if you think about it, the DAC's, you know, not really a great place to do all that stuff. For one, um, unless you're doing fancy ASIC-based stuff, upsampling usually requires um, some electricity, some CPU energy. Um, it requires that you're doing maths. Um, and, and those kinds of things tend to generate noise in integrated circuits. And that noise is right next to the analog output stage of your DAC, which is kind of not what you want. Um, that's, so that's these guys true. will go through heroic efforts to, especially like in the case of PS Audio Record or some of the other, other folks, to, sep to, to prevent that noise from doing that contamination because noise and follows this inverse squares law. And so the closer it is to the thing that, you're, that will be bothered by it, the more work you have to do to keep that noise from contaminating things. Um, but I, I'd have to say that the vast majority of people that today or even in the recent past got involved in this area of playback, if you want to call it that, started with a Mac mini or some computer mm -hmm. that they then added a piece of software to, whether it was J River Media Center or it was a more sophisticated and less well-known player that might have DSP functionality. I mean, that seems to be where it sort of started, may still live, but now we are obviously moving into the area of let's make it sound as good as possible. Yeah, so with making it sound as good as possible, what we're really doing, the simple, it's a very its a very simple thing, tends to be, although we make it complicated. Um, but to make it as simple as possible, what we wanna do is put all that uh, heavy computation stuff on a computer that's someplace else in your house, as far away from your audio system as possible. Um, and then you have a very lightweight, very low noise, very low power renderer type of device that's in your audio system. And all it's doing is copying whatever that hard work that that other machine did, it's just copying those bits um, unmodified to your DAC. Um, it's just reading from the network and copying them to the DAC. Um, it doesn't have any intelligence. It doesn't know what's going on. And that, that way we're separating as far as possible the noisy parts from the quiet parts. And that's, um, and that's kind of where you'd, you'd want that upsampling and DSP and anything else that you're doing to happen someplace else in your house, in your neighbor's house, if you can get them to go along with your scheme. Um, and over a long fiber connection would be better, but um, it really as far away as you can go um, is what we're after there. All right. Uh, yeah, go, yeah ahead. go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add a point to what, what David was talking about. If you remember his, his talk in February when he, he kind of did a, an in-room survey of the number of folks that were using Rune, I, I would say it was maybe 35, 40% of folks at the time, you know, and uh, there were some kind of, you know, comments in the room. Well, it doesn't sound real good when I, it doesn't sound as good as, as you know, my other things like Jay River. And that's simply because people had a computer uh, and Rune needs processing power. So it needs some level of, you know, computer bandwidth and processing power right next to their stuff in their audio rack. And, and I remember David saying that the guidance from Rune Corporate was get that thing as far away from your audio rack as possible. And that's because Rune does, you know, have, have some 
reasonably demanding processing requirements, bandwidth requirements to, to work properly. And the reason that it sounds better when you get it away is the good old inverse square law. And I remember reading an article by John Atkinson maybe eight or nine years ago where John was talking about having computers next to your audio rack is a bad, bad, bad idea. And it's because these high bandwidth CPUs and GPUs and all the computers that are sold as consumer computers have high bandwidth GPUs now put out very large amounts of noise. And then noise can be picked up by your speaker cables and fed right back into your amplifier backwards mm -hmm. to be reamplified as noise. Okay, this is why it's a really good idea to get the computer as far away from the audio rack as possible. And I'll um, have people tell me, oh, my computer's not that noisy. I've got it liquid cooled and it's really quiet. <laughs> you, don't, you don't really notice the noise. The noise is ultrasonic noise. Yes. It's RF noise, it's CMI, yes. and, and it, it has effects on the performance of your system in the audio band. So even Absolutely. though you're, you, you can't perceive the noise directly, you can, you can perceive its impact on your system. It'll be, there'll be less listening engagement. It'll be more fatiguing, more irritating. It'll be uncommon for you to be able to sit down and listen to a digital album from start to finish where you can do that effortlessly with your vinyl rig or your tape rig or whatever. And then you're scratching your head as to, to try to figure out why. Um, probably that's it. All these, all these sources of noise are, are, are irritating to us at a very low level. That's um, right. All right. Cool. All right, take it away, David. All right, so I put some examples here in case you want to go shopping afterwards or not um, of some things that are popular. I don't necessarily recommend all of these things, but to give you an idea, um, stuff in the kind of entry level column. Uh, let me explain what we're looking at first, though. Uh, so um, the first thing that we're defining here is um, is what I call a network audio player. You'll see them called streamers a lot as well. Um, we define these things in terms of um, what goes in and what comes out. So um, for a streamer, in our, for our purposes, um, and I think this is probably, it's not 100% consistent, but the industry sort of mostly does this, um, though there's some overloading. It's networking in. So the way your music gets to the streamer is over a network. Streamers genu genu generally don't have internal storage. You're not gonna put your library inside of the streamer. It's gonna come from some other place in your home network or from the internet. Um, so the audio comes in over the network and then it goes out over analog. And that analog could be uh, RCA connectors, it could be XLR, you could have speaker terminals. Um, there are some streamers that actually have amplifiers built into them as well. Um, we'll. We'll kind of lump all of those into the same kind of category. Um, and then when you get a copy of the slide deck, um, there are uh, links here to all these different things that I'm not gonna click on because I don't wanna go back in time or whatever. Um, but generally speaking, these things are, you know, kind of inexpensive on the order of $500 or so, or, or in some cases quite a bunch less. Um, these things are generally more expensive up into the you know, five figures kind of thing. Um, what, what, what's the difference between these two? Presumably these sound a bit better, but they're much nicer to deal with, right? They're, they're, they weigh a lot, they look pretty, um, they, uh, they have pretty lights, um, they've got really nice dials. Um, they, uh, the user experience is going to be a little bit nicer. If you're using them with playing software, you'll get more information about what they're doing internally than you will with one of these less expensive things. Um, so, um, but these are, in my, for me anyway, these are kind of luxury items for the most part. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want. Um, Performance-wise, the difference between these two over the last few years has is, is, is shrunk quite a bit. <laughs> Um, so the percentage of performance that you can get from one of these entry level things uh, compared to one of these things is, is, is getting vanishingly small. Um, but, uh, but there are still some advantages to, uh, to going with, with some of these options if, uh, if you have the means and the inclination to do so. And then on the DIY side, which, which I have a warm spot in my heart for, mm -hmm. um, are some, uh, some much less expensive things, but they typically require you to get out a screwdriver, generally not a soldering iron anymore. So um, it's become pretty simple, more like snapping Legos together than, um, than actually, you know, smelting iron and all the <laughs> other stuff that you used to have to do when you wanted to make things. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there may be some uh, time spent on the internet looking at uh, YouTube videos or trying to understand how people did things 
um, rather than listening to music on this path where one of these things, you buy the thing and generally you plug it in and it works uh, more of an appliance type of approach. But um, all of these things can be satisfying. I know we've got amplifier builders, we've got speaker builders, we've got other folks that are, just, we have turntable builders, which uh, wrecks my mind to even think about. But, um, but uh, you know, for, for a lot of people, the satisfaction of building something is a, an important part of this. And I think it's been the case for hi-fi since really kind of the beginning. In the early days, you, if you wanted audio equipment, you did have to build it yourself. And so I think that uh, kind of DIY spirit, I think is useful here. One of the reasons I think it's particularly useful is because digital changes really fast, right? So, um, so this week I bought um, this little <laughs> DAC um, and put it together. Um, it needed some assembly, which took a while and was fun. Um, it's SPDIF and USB in and then uh, analog out, RCA analog out. Um, it, it is, it was about a hundred dollars, um, all in, uh, for me to put this thing together and it, it completely destroys a DAC that I paid $1,500 for just 10 years ago, as far as performance goes and sound quality. Um, so these things, you know, uh, these things, you know, change really, really fast. Um, I'll have a link and some pictures of this thing that you can look at later if you're curious. Um, and so, you know, there, there's, there's, there can be some heartache, I guess, a little bit in spending a ton of money for something that and then to watch it go obsolete or to be uh, superseded by something that costs um, a tenth of the price. But um, that's kind of the way thing that goes. You know, in the speaker world and, and, and for amplifiers and, and for other components, turntables, you know, you're, you, if, you, if you buy quality bits 10 years from now, they'll still be worth, you know, plus or minus what you bought them for, but pretty close, especially if you bought them used. But even if you bought them new, um, you're probably not going to take more than a 50% bath on something like that. But on the digital side, if I wanted to sell that DAC that I bought 10 years ago now, I'd be lucky if I got enough to pay for one of these <laughs> um, just because of how quickly things go out of date. So um, that's something to keep in mind. I tell people um, that I tend to think of digital components like I do my smartphone. So, um, you know, invest accordingly. Um, uh, uh, we've got another category that I'll touch on briefly. I know we're a bit over time, but... Uh, Renders is, is a term that you hear people, people talk a lot, about a lot. The term that I've been trying to coin is network audio transports because it's um, similar to CD transports that we had back in uh, the previous century. When Theta and all the rest of those people were working on stuff like that. So, you know, something that just that provides, it, its output is only digital. There's no analog output to this thing. Right. Um, since we're doing computer audio or networking audio, um, instead of getting the music off of a disc, we're getting it from the network, same as we did for the um, players on the previous slide. Um, but instead of analog out, we're getting digital out, and it'll be in the form of USB or SPDIF, AES views, popular on the pro side of things because uh, they can use balanced cables for long runs. And I squared S is this tweaky weird thing that a couple of people do, but there aren't any standards around it. Um, so I've got some uh, some entry level examples, um, some of uh, some of these audiophile ones, some of these brands you might recognize, um, and then some DIY things that you can explore um, and mess around with later on. I have the. Uh, um, I'd just like to add something, David, really yeah, quickly. Please. You know, David and I had a fair bit of discussion about the lexicon and trying to standardize on the lexicon so everybody's on the same page. And the problem in the industry right now is there's lots of different terms being used essentially for the same type of um, device. Uh, yeah. and, and David and I just, I, I think by nature, like to kind of describe things functionally in terms of what is it that it's actually doing. And so uh, David had this idea of, you know, hey, it's just like a CD transport, except rather than a physical disk that it's transporting information off of to a DAC, it's basically a file on a network somewhere transporting it off to a DAC. Uh, and so we're going to kind of standardize in you know in our discussions going forward on these devices as network audio transports now they may have some sort of endpoint functionality where they function as a renderer or a rune endpoint and that's fine they may not uh, but they all kind of basically do the same thing as they take in a networking uh, a networking uh, data stream and they output it generally as usb to a dac or some other type of music player whether it be a, you know integrated dac preamp integrated whatever Right, but it's basically networking information in out, USB out the other end, and we're going to call them network audio transports. And there'll be some uh, some manufacturers that, of course, make their things a little bit harder to classify. If you're yeah. familiar with Render, they want to make music servers that also act as network audio transports, and so you'll see some of these things that are combined together. Right. Um, I mean, you can totally combine these things together. Again, the more you 
squeezed into one box, the more work you have to do to keep the noise from causing problems. And that's why your our render W20 is $18,000. Um, but you can buy an Intel NUC for $500 that um, as far as a music server goes, um, can perform um, equally as well. So it's, um, you know, it's just kind of depends on, on what you want to do with, with the architecture, whether you can leverage the distributed nature of these things or not. Uh, music servers, uh, speaking of. Um, so a music server is, is, is for our purposes, um, it's, it's a machine that probably stores your music library or has access to it. Maybe you've got a NAS that your music library relies on, re resides on you know, the actual files, right? But the music server um, organizes your library. It's what kind of figures out what all the metadata is. It enables you to search things. If you search for, um, for Bob Marley, it's the thing that's going to go through all of your music and try to figure out which albums um, he appears on and that kind of thing. That's the thing that does all that computation and returns those results back. If you're looking at album art on a tablet, the music server is what's sending that information to the tablet so that you, it can render that and show you what you're looking at. Um, and then the music server has awareness of the different audio devices that you have throughout your house, um, what their capabilities are. You might have a DAC that is DSD capable in one room, but not in the other, and it'll work out what the, what the capabilities of those DACs are and send them an appropriate stream. Um, it's what, will sam what generally handles your upsampling and any other kind of DSP that's zone specific or not that you wanna do. Um, so the music server in our world is this thing that that does all of that heavy lifting. Ideally, a music server shouldn't be in your listening room. It shouldn't have a DAC attached to it or in it, um, but the industry breaks those rules all the time, as you'll see, um, and that's pretty normal. Um, all right, cool. So uh, there's some examples here of those things. Under the DIY category, we just put some generic computers that you can put software on, and these are uh, pretty popular. Intel's next unit of computing is just this little tiny box, not much bigger than what I showed you, that can run Linux or Windows or whatever and the Mac Mini everybody knows about. Um, all right, Stephen, back to you. We're gonna talk about power a little bit and then at some point we're gonna draw a line in the sand and, yeah. and talk about music. <laughs> I think we'll draw a line in the sand right after I talk about that. I'm just replying to a question here real quick. There was a question about like, you know, why didn't we kind of discuss this in order uh, from somebody, which is a reasonable question in terms of the order of the slides and what we're talking about. So uh, I'm just gonna kind of talk about the order of how things are arranged, you know, from from where your music is to your DAC, okay. Uh, and if you just reverse the order of the slides, you've got as as Jeff as David was Hello? just talking about. Can you hear me? Hello. I don't know if this I don't know if this slide helps with your order thing, but yeah, that actually might help. So you've got you've got a music server somewhere far away. Uh, I'm not going to get into into the, like some folks are saying, well, the streamer is a computer. Yes, it is, but it's a different class of computer that's less noisy. So let's not get down into the weeds at this point in time in this first session. Okay, David just talked about that a few minutes ago. Um, but you've got at some location, you've got something that functions as a computer. Uh, it could be a NUC, it could be a Mac Mini, it could be in some cases even a NAS. Uh, it makes some sort of network connection uh, to your uh, network in your home. It, and it has some sort of attachment to file storage, either internally or externally, uh, uh, via the network if you're using primarily a streaming service. That information is then sent uh, out of wherever that location is via network connection down to your audio rack. Uh, there may be ethernet switches at various locations. You can buy audio grade ethernet switches now at your destination and downstream like the ether region that Alex talked about in a in a uh, guest thing about six weeks ago. And then it goes to your, you know, either your streamer endpoint, network bridge, whatever it is, basically ethernet into that device, uh, USB out to your DAC. That's the flow, okay, from start to finish. Um, uh, again, just to kind of uh, reiterate, the music server generally needs to be high bandwidth uh, and they generally oftentimes come with GPUs, even though we don't need those typically. Uh, uh, the streamer is a lower bandwidth, less noise. It, it is a computer, but it's specifically designed to be less noisy. And the, and the design parameters are, we want to have this thing create as little noise as possible because it's going to be in the audio rack and we don't want a bunch of high bandwidth noise near all our analog amplification componentry. So um, that's the rationale for why you have these these types of devices, whether it be a, a network audio transport, a streamer combination device, 
at the destination and downstream is, is you want to keep all the high bandwidth music serving activity, NUC, NAS like, whatever, as far away as possible. Um, so, um, uh, so that's kind of just to finish up on that. Um, David, do you want to transition over to music? Uh, yeah. at this, I, We've got oh, some more. You guys can look at the slides later, but yeah. there's some more pictures of things. Somebody, yeah. people have questions about media converter things. We can look, you can yeah. look at that. We'll, we'll touch on that at probably another session. Yeah. Another picture of example showing those. Yeah. These are some boxes. You know, you know you're familiar boxes. with what normal audio components look like. These don't look like normal audio components, but they don't necessarily apart from this one, look hugely like computers either. So the industry no. is trying at least a little bit to meet us halfway, I would say, right? Um, generally speaking, if I owned any of these, and I do own one of these little guys down here, sorry, if I owned any of these things, I, I do own one of these little guys down here, I would put it, uh, I wouldn't put it in my listening room anyway, even though this one's quite pretty. Um, it doesn't really belong in the listening room. So no, it doesn't. Uh, we'll talk about that later. That's a picture of my little cheap and cheerful DAC thing that I was telling you about. Um, we're working from home, those of us who are still working. Um, so this is my kind of home office setup, a $99 DAC driving some powered monitors. Um, Rune Bridge is running on uh, on uh, my laptop. It's Rune Bridge is just a tiny kind of lightweight piece of software. And then Rune Server is running two floors below that does all the heavy lifting stuff. So I was able to build an office audio system that's pretty respectable for 400 bucks and pretty happy with it. Uh, music. Um, Let's talk about music stuff. Um, one of the things that I th thought that was pretty cool over this last week was um, the release, and actually maybe happened a week or two ago, but of um, the kind of 60th anniversary uh, here in 2020 of John Coltrane's Giant Steps. Um, I remember the first time I listened to that music back in the previous century, my jazz mentor was trying to get me to understand <laughs> jazz and it just sounded like a whole bunch of random notes and uh, I couldn't really make any sense of it. And I don't think I really appreciated it until um, until I got at least into my 50s. I'm not sure why it took that long, but uh, it is a an absolute genius piece. Um, in the remaster, um, they've 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 kind of put together this massive uh, playlist, and um, there's a link to it here um, that takes you to a title. But um, link to it somewhere. Sorry, my my mouse is getting away from me. This is a link to title um, that you can look at later on. But um, they have like all the different outtakes and all the different kind of versions of uh, these pieces. It's sort of like watching a movie where they had some deleted scenes. Um, after you listen to them for a while, it becomes obvious why they were deleted and <laughs> not as good as the, the seven canonized tracks that are on the album, but it's still uh, interesting from a historical perspective. But um, the, 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 this remastering job is, is actually really, really good as far as sound quality goes for audio files. Um, I've listened, I've got at least three other releases of this album. One of them was, was from uh, music, um, mu Musical Fidelity, MoFi, um, those guys, uh, and Music Fidelity Sound Lab. And um, uh, even, even that one uh, really kind of falls flat. They're all kind of different interpretations, but um, I think this is the most insightful and enjoying one, enjoyable one that I've heard. So sometimes, you know, at least usually when I look at music that's been remastered, I, I, I think that's synonymous with dynamic range compression or just kind of spoiling it so that it sounds good for people in their cars or with earbuds. <laughs> but um, the clientele and people who tend to prefer this album, um, I, I think are more sound quality focused. And so, um, so this is definitely worth a listen. I bought my copy of just the seven track version on HD tracks, but I think Tidal and Kobos both have this available for streaming if you want to listen to every single um, kind of outtake and all the rest of that stuff. Um, definitely worth exploring. There's also a new Thelonious Monk, I think that was done locally here in the Bay Area. Um, oh, really? Yes. And I'm trying to recall whether it was, it might have been in Palo Alto. And it was done back just before his death, a few years before his death. And it is actually exceptional, quite good. good. Yeah, Thank if you, you find it, please send it to us or throw it in the chat comments before we drop off and we'll uh, add it to the slide. Sure, definitely. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about something that um, I, I found in the radio mode of Rune. So those of you that use Rune know that there's a radio mode. And if you, it's great for kind of discovering content either within your ripped library on a hard drive, but it's also great if you subscribe to a streaming service as well, because it will pull content from both and just start playing stuff. <clears throat> and I was listening to some classical stuff, oh, probably a couple months ago, 
and uh, this wonderful recording by Yul Son uh, of Mozart Piano Concerto Number no. Twenty One. There's also another one. On this album uh, uh, was really wonderful. Uh, this is on the Onyx uh, label. Uh, you can buy it from Onyx's website if you go search for it. Uh, and I think the link takes you there. Yeah, there it is. Thank you, David. Uh, and um, it's really delightful. Um, she's a wonderful, wonderful pianist. Um, apparently, she performed this piece on YouTube, and it got something like 10 million views <laughs> uh, 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 in terms of uh, people watching it. So it's a delightful performance. You know, Mozart uh, was well known for having a sense of humor, uh, and you definitely pick up on his humor uh, uh, in this, in this, you know, very famous piece of music. Um, this piano concerto was also used in the movie Elvira Madigan as well, so it's very well known. But it's absolutely delightful. It's beautifully um, uh, performed by both the Academy St. Martin and the Fields. What, what more can I say about those guys? You know, you guys know those guys. They're, they're, you know, one of the preeminent orchestras in the world. This was also the last, um, recording made before Neville Mariner passed away. So this is his last kind of recorded performance uh, as well. So it's an absolute delight. Um, again, discovered using Rune's radio mode. Uh, I've been listening to it a couple times a week since I discovered it because it's so delightful. Um, and then, uh, and David listened to it as well and, and, he, and he enjoyed it as well. Um, yeah, so, for sure. yeah, and then, um, uh, there's a link here to high definition tape transfers. Um, I saw on um, Steve Guttenberg's Audio Feel Like Daily Show a video uh, that he did with one of his 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 helpers uh, visiting the guy that does these tape transfers. Um, these are from the analog master or analog tapes that used to be sale for, for sale in the 50s and 60s, uh, and this guy uh, does a superb job very, very, with a great deal of love and effort and care on uh, um, basically remastering these analog tape master, uh, analog tapes um, to digital. Uh, and there's a variety of formats. Uh, there's DSD, there's 24192, 24176, et cetera. You can, you can find all that in the formats available tab there. Um, but in particular, he worked with, uh, the, with uh, the guy that makes the Merrill Audio uh, tape preamplifier uh, and they work together uh, and they're using a Studer deck with this Merrill Audio tape preamplifier and then it's you can see the ad for it there on the site um, and uh, and then going out to digital and he spends a great deal of time remastering when necessary the audio for example um, uh, some of these recordings have what's called a tape bump in them and he met he edits that out very carefully and things like that these are all very affordable. They're in the range of fourteen to sixteen dollars, about the price of a CD, and they all come from um, uh, these tapes uh, that were, you know, made with a great deal of care and effort back in the late fifties and early sixties. And my understanding is some of the the music studios are actually sending their library of tapes to him uh, to uh, remaster into audio because the tapes are falling apart in some cases um, based on the material they're on and they want to have an archive of the music. And so they're actually providing him with content as well. So a big, you know, thumbs up for these guys as well. And the content is affordable. So uh, that is our um, uh, music uh, recommendations for this month to check out. Yeah, very cool. And that if you guys have, uh, anybody have anything uh, that they'd like to call it that they thought was really interesting to listen to this week, um, we can add it. By the way, Steve put in his Thelonious Muck album. There's a link in there. Thank you, Steve, uh, right. for awesome. it on, on Amazon uh, yeah. at the Palo Alto sessions. So thanks, Steve, for doing that. If I can figure out where chat. I think, yeah. Wanted to get this copied onto there. Pardon me while I live edit in front of everybody. <laughs> yeah, this way you guys will have a link to it. By the way, as 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 David is doing this, um, when we sent out this this information, you saw a lot of things in red links or hypertext like stuff. You can click on all those. Those are actual hypertext links. So, you know, if you want to find out about the Inuos or the optical rendu or whatever, 
you know, whatever the things we had in there, you can click on that and that will take you actually to that manufacturer's site. So you can actually look up that device there. Um, so those are active links in, in the presentation information there. So just right. like the, yeah. Cool. Uh, oh, I don't, I've, I've done gone full screen and it's gone making again. I've got my uh, phone connected as well so that I can see when the display is totally ah, screwed up and try to there you go. and try to compensate for it. But, yeah. Uh, Looks see. like it works better in edit mode than it does in presentation. I know, it's pretty, it's it's pretty kind weird. of funny. Yeah. But I don't know. Anyway, we'll figure this out. Um, yeah. Other people have figured it out. I don't know why it doesn't seem to like me on my tablet, but um, now I know that doesn't work. Should have tried it before. <laughs> um, Anyways, uh, Q and A. We have some questions um, yes. that we could chat about with. Um, uh, let me let us run through these real quick since they're pre, pre on here, and then we'll use the last bit that we have um, in case anybody has any that are uh, that are that are kind of burning that you want to ask. Um, let's touch on one of these first, anyway, and then we'll 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 go to the floor with uh, questions, and then we'll fill in with the last two if we need. Yeah. Um, but one of the questions that uh, someone sent in uh, sent in over the survey was. Um, what are the sonic benefits of a high-end DAC versus just a good DAC these days? I touched on it a little bit in what I was talking about, but the the performance envelope between um, kind of the, you know, your $100 DAC, like the little one that I showed, and then a $5,000 DAC has is, is been shrinking a lot over the years. Now, the, uh, the, the, there's still the, that um, irritating A part of the DAC, right? The analog section is still kind of a big thing. And so, um, building a really high quality analog output stage, um, an output buffer if you need, and avoiding things like feedback and op amp design or amplifier design and discrete circuits and all the, all the rest of the stuff that applies to any analog component. All that stuff is still inside of a DAC. It's made more complicated by the fact that it has to be adjacent to um, some digital uh, chips as well. And so noise isolation becomes um, an even bigger concern. And so your more expensive DACs are going to presumably do those things better. They should have a nicer analog output stage. But by the, by the numbers, if you look at measurements, um, there's this audio science review site that you can go to where um, this guy, Armin, has is, is, is measured literally hundreds of DACs. Um, and he's got this $20,000 super fancy thing to measure how accurate they are. Um, and uh, let's come up with some useful metrics for kind of determining what the performance envelope is. And if you sort all of them top to bottom from the best performing one to the least, you'll see some DACs that are, you know, in the five figures, uh, but you'll also see a lot of DACs that are under $1,000 that are really near the top of the list. Um, so in terms of what they call objective transparency, um, there's, there's, you know, for really well-designed DACs, the per, per price is really kind of almost not a consideration. Um, the, um, it's possible to come up with DACs that are, that are well under $1,000 that perform um, uh, what they call, you know, with, with kind of perfect transparency as far as noise and distortion goes. Again, um, music is more complicated than one kilohertz sine waves. Um, there's, uh, you know, how do, how do we get sine, sound stage? How do we get dynamics? How do we get, um, you know, kind of realistic voicing? And then, you know, if you connect a DAC up to the analog output of a DAC to a measurement instrument, um, the loading and characteristics of that device are going to be different than the loading and characteristics of your analog preamp or your amplifier, whatever you're connecting it to. Um, you're plugging it into a real-world wall outlet, not, um, you know, not a bench power supply. So there's a lot of kind of different different things that come into play in a real-world environment versus a, a test bench. But um, the fact that we're getting vanishingly close in performance between the best or the most expensive DACs and the least expensive DACs is is good news for us as audiophiles. It means that um, it means that we're getting to a place where a lot of uh, high-performance sound is kind of democratized. Um, to use a hopefully not too overloaded term these days, um, that we're you know that, that you don't have to um, that you don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars if you don't want to, um, especially if you're just looking at getting started with digital, um, or um, you know you're 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 wanting to make kind of a the minimum investment that you need to be able to get something that's comparable or or approaches what you're experiencing with vinyl playback or tape playback. Um, you know, it used to be that you really kind of needed to, to spend a ton of money to do that. And it's not that, that critical anymore, as long as you kind of shop wisely. Um, and also keep in mind that, um, that your $500 DAC that you buy is probably going to be something that you give to your nephew um, in three years, because you're going to replace it with something that's better anyway. Um, yeah, just to add to that really quickly, you know, um, you can kind of, 
you know, build up various things on your own if you like do DIY types of things. Um, I'm, I'm not going to comment on my personal views about ASR in terms of a review site from as the perspective of a scientist, but what I will say is that that there are great turnkey solutions. Shit Audio has become very successful over the last 10 years. These guys know DAX. Uh, Mike Moffat is, is, is one of the original developers, one of the very first DAX, and, and I can tell you because I owned a range of their products, uh, from starting at about 100 bucks, you know, up to $2,500, you can get into very good sounding DACs for the money uh, in, in from 100 bucks to $249 to, you know, $700 to $1,200 to $2,500 at Shit Audio. Um, and, um, and the nice thing is, is that, uh, you know, um, uh, those DACs are well made. Uh, Jason Stoddard knows analog output. He's a brilliant designer, in my opinion. Uh, the price products, I think, w perform way above their price points in terms of performance. Uh, and um, you also get a five-year warranty, which I don't know if any other manufacturer gives a five-year warranty for a product. So uh, there's very affordable um, uh, turnkey solutions that perf that perform well above, you know, their classic. Uh, uh, price point here. So, um, so there are lots of things available. Certainly, you know, I've heard amazing DACs from Esoteric and, and, uh, and other companies like that. If you've got, um, you know, the budget for it, you know, you will get what you pay for ultimately. But, you know, as, 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 as David's pointed out multiple times, this is a fast changing scene. And, you know, I think you can get a lot for your money and not have a massive capital investment for uh, an area that's going to be changing fairly rapidly, I would say. I don't know how uh, much of this you can see, but this is around there. So the first 10 DACs in the list. And right. you see DACs that are, you know, in the five figures. You see DACs that are less than $500. Um, there's no rhyme or reason. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and again, I'm not, you know, they're using a sign ed percentile score. There's a big, long discussion at Super Best Audio Friends about how valid this is, you can take it for what it's worth. You know, yeah. I'm a big believer in measurements, but I will tell you right now, music as a construct of the brain, it is, it is not just simply listening to fre test frequencies, okay? Yeah. So just like color vision is a, is a construct of our brain, our eyes are not spectrophotometers, right? We see color uh, using a, a, a lookup table map in our brain and we process music separate from noise in a similar manner, right? And so music is a construct of the brain. ASR doesn't deal with any of that, right? Nope. And, you know, and I can tell you, I'd much rather listen to a Dyna Stereo 70 than a Crown DC 300, even though the Crown measures better. So let's not get into that. But, um, but, uh, uh, but there, the point is, there's lots of uh, very good performing DACs that are very affordable today. Uh, and there's more and more all the time. Um, Yep. Uh, from my, you know, so um, I think we've answered that question in <laughs> probably more than enough detail. So. I think the takeaway is to have fun with it. Um, yes. If, yes. If fun to you is buying a six thousand dollar PS Audio thing, then you know you do you. If fun yeah. is buying a hundred dollar thing that you can throw away, um, then that's yep. fine too. And there's a lot of space in between those two things. Absolutely. Um, okay. Questions uh, from anybody who's still remaining. Uh, first of all, the link that you post. Uh, posted David uh, is broken. Which link? Which link, Gregory? The DAX list objective not complete picture. Oh, it works for me. I just clicked it. Oh, kind of weird. Oh, weird. yeah. So, so oh, Gregory, it, you, it, Gregory, you may you may need the document uh, to go to Google Docs to see the link work. It may not work. I, I put it in the chat. It, it should work oh. in the chat as well. But oh, I don't know. Oh, Maybe I see. Not. It's in the chat. I, I think what it is is that, 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 that it looks like there's a login that I need to do. Oh, okay. Um, also, uh, David, a number of months ago when you did a presentation for our group, you had mentioned a software that can do file conversion. Uh, sure. So essentially bulk file conversion that will essentially preserve the same file structure. What is the name of that? Um, the, the, the software that I use is, there's a bunch of them out there, but the software that I use is DB power amp. I don't know. It's like 40 bucks or something like that. Um, and, uh, it's, I use it most of the time for ripping CDs, but, um, it also has really nice batch conversion types of things for a while. I needed, uh, 
an MP3 copy of my entire music library that I could put in my wife's car because um, I didn't have space for that. So I just pointed it at my entire library and said MP3, the whole thing came back in a couple days and I had a directory structure that um, that had all the MP3s, but it'll do conversions to and from just about any format you can imagine. That sounds good. And it does a decent job of preserving metadata. Not all formats support all metadata tags. Right. And so, you know, if you convert from, from FLAC to uh, wave and back, you may not have the same metadata exactly, even though the music content will be, you know, bit for bit identical. So it's, that's, but that's just, that's not really its fault. I think it's a, a music problem, but preserving album art for formats to support that, it does a pretty good job of all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, so lots of people like DB Power Amp, uh, Gregory. Um, I would say if you did a poll of, you know, people that rip a lot of music, it would probably be number one on their list. Uh, I wasn't aware that it did batch uh, ripping, but that's that's another nice feature for it. So, yeah, I, I just know that Apple's looking at, at getting rid of iTunes entirely, or so I've read. And I want to get off ALAC as soon as I can do it, and move everything to FLAC. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, XLD will also do that for you, um, Gregory. But um, but. Um, uh, Audiovana will play both formats just fine, right? So, um, well, the thing with XLD is that XLD requires you to basically do each individual album. No, no, um, I, I, I understand. And I want yeah, to yeah. do it all once. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just saying that that I don't know that you need to convert all of your ALAC format to FLAC with the like if you use Audiovana as your music player. But okay. I guess if you're using iTunes like on, on your portal device, like, you know, your phone at work and stuff, then you'd probably want to do that, so. Right. Yeah. A lot of things are moving to flag just because it's it's an open standard and, and you know, 50 years from now, you're likely to still be able to play a flag file, assuming that right. any of us are, out, are still around to be able to hear it. Um, yeah. Because uh, it's not owned by yeah, any particular company or anything like that. And the metadata support is, is 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 very well standardized as well. So like I say, if you convert something from FLAC to WAVE, your media player may or may not be able to see the album art. The, like yeah. WAVE support is kind of, uh, even though it's a very common format, the metadata support is flaky, but uh, it's pretty universally good with FLAC. Another good thing about FLAC is we're seeing more and more radio stations around the world that are coming on and actually playing using FLAC, yeah. mm -hmm. which is really cool. I, I listen to classical musical music every morning on a station out of Helsinki, mm -hmm. and and I don't even have to listen to Finnish. They just play music. Yeah, that's very piece that's after amazing. piece. That's and great. Right here in California, we've got uh, Paradise, which is really nice. So there there are a bunch of different stations around the world that are moving to a CD equivalent, free. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Uh, I just want to make one comment to, to, for for Gregory, and that's, you know, Apple is, because I'm a Mac person, <clears throat> and they are, they have based out iTunes, but the things are still working. The new thing is music. They've taken the functionality of iTunes and just broken it, broken it apart. The music part of iTunes is now called music. It still works the same. <clears throat> it works exactly the same. Everything runs. In fact, I have my old, my Mac mini won't have won't take the new things. It's running iTunes, but I have some from newer things. It's music and everything works perfectly. You may want to convert your stuff, but that's a separate issue, but you don't need to convert it because they've, 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 they've changed the name of the software portion to music. Thank I mean, you, Larry. Yeah, it, it's just to make the, the operating system more in line with the iOS things that they, <clears throat> that they developed. Cool. I mean, I'm running my stuff in ALIC, so, and I'm not really changing it unless I need to, so. Great. Thanks, Larry. Just me. Uh, I want to kind of cover some of the other questions. Um, did anybody um, uh, that's on the stream that wanted to ask a question? Uh, if not, I'll start trying to, we'll start trying to uh, answer some of the ones that were in the chat. Yes, I wanted to ask if you could identify some of those uh, radio stations that are playing FLAC files. That sounds really interesting. Uh, yeah, I, you know what? Why don't you send me an email? Because I, I have to dig through all my stuff. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are a number of them, and they come and go, and sometimes they play well, and sometimes they play badly, and they 
So yeah, and I'm Steve by the Bay at gmail.com. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Sure. Okay, I'm gonna maybe just start uh, seeing if I can answer some of the questions that we had here uh, in the chat really quickly. Um, so uh, curious, Jeff had a question, why not Inuos products? Actually, Jeff, in the slide there, I put the Inuos Zen Mark III in there. Uh, that was a product that I gave serious consideration to buying. Uh, that is, uh, a, again, a combination device. It functions basically as a, um, as a, uh, a rune endpoint, a uh, music server, a ripper, uh, uh, a streamer. Uh, it's a very nice product. Um, it's gotten great reviews. Uh, something I gave serious consideration to buying at one point personally. Uh, and I believe that uh, uh, it's got very good uh, audio quality. Um, the reason I, I personally didn't decide to buy it is it's basically got, and maybe it's shielded appropriately, but it's got a pretty powerful computer inside the chassis. And I made the decision to go with the SOTUM SMS 200 Ultra Neo because I don't want to high bend with the device in my audio rack. So that's maybe that's just me being overly uh, anal retentive about it. But I, uh, you know, the biggest improvement I made in probably in the last eight years in my digital audio was getting the damn Mac Mini as far away from the audio rack as possible. So um, anyway, but I've heard great things about it. Uh, there's a great review on it uh, by John Darko from about a year or so ago. You can look up on YouTube, by the way. So um, I've heard good things about it as well. It's, it's I think it's around five thousand dollars or so. Yes, yes. Um, and this is you know I mean it's an older architecture. Putting everything in one box. If you really want yep. that older architecture and you want it to be good, then you have to pay uh, yep. a lot of money to get that. If you're okay with separating things, you can save a bunch of money and get pretty pretty close to the same, if not better, performance. Uh, by doing so, just kind of depends on you know what what your architectural preferences are. I'll be surprised if if we're still seeing these kind of all in one boxes um, as often in the next you know five years from now. I think people are going to start to realize that um, you know we have uh, and I think maybe this whole COVID thing is pushing this even a little bit more, right? So people are stuck at home, they're making investments in their home network, they're building things up, they're getting uh, you know better internet Ethernet or, or excuse me internet connections. And, you know, you had of you know the rise of smart homes and a lot of this kind of networking technology that you need to have in your house to be able to support these kinds of audio pursuits. And you know, back in the day, you didn't have a, a, a network jack where your audio system was, and and adding one was not going to be an easy proposition. So, these all-in-one products that let you just put an appliance um, that that had the server and the the renderer and and the DAC and all the rest of that stuff in or right next to each other was kind of what you had to do. But um, you know, as, as, as homes and, and as listeners become more sophisticated, you're seeing the infrastructure being put in place to be able to separate those and the benefits of doing that, both in terms of performance and especially in terms of cost. The other, yeah. thing, the other thing that also matters for a lot of people is simplicity and flexibility. That's why Sonos has done so well. Yeah, you know, no, Sonos That's why is, Rune, is uh, using amazing. Rune in a lot of homes is, is the way to go if they want to play in various zones around the house. Right. So yeah, I mean, I don't know how Inos handles it, but I mean, if, if you want to have music in five different rooms, you have to have five of these $5,000 boxes. I mean, that, that doesn't scale to me, right? But, um, you know, like you say, with Sonos, or with Rune, or with, with some of these other approaches, um, you, know, you can do that kind of stuff without having to, to sell an organ. Right, right. We had a question here from Jeff also, uh, just about, you know, some... Um, would we get a point this evening where you offer a suggestion to various price points or is that in the 401? I don't know what the 401 class is, but, <laughs> but um, Jeff, you know, I think David has talked about the fact that, that there are very affordable uh, solutions all along the path, right? You can build up a NUC for, you know, 500 bucks or so. You can buy uh, um, a network audio transport, like a, you know, you could buy a, used to be able to buy a micro rendu for about $650. I think they're now about 800. Um, there's Raspberry Pis that are in the three to $400 price range uh, that have, you know, from Allo Digi. So, you know, for under a thousand dollars, you can put together a very nice little, you know, streaming system with a computer somewhere else. And then you can run through your, from your network down to um, uh, a network audio transport. Um, and you can kind of go from there. I would say for my own system, I've got a Mac mini. 
I'm using the Mac mini because I already owned it, you know, for the last seven or eight years. And why buy another computer just to have another computer? And yeah. then my, my, my uh, SMS Ultra Neo cost me about a thousand bucks. And I've got a, you know, I've got a, a fiber media converter uh, to run fiber simply for me. That was just the easiest way to get it from the bedroom to the living room, uh, just from a practicality perspective. Um, uh, but, you know, in, from about 1000 to $1,500, you can put together a very good quality streaming system with a music server and uh, uh, something like a network audio transport that will feed your DAC with very good sounding music. So I hope, Jeff, that answered your question about that. Um, uh, super simple systems was the least but noisy simple, least noisy but simple way to get from title to a DAC. I, I think the, the way I just described it um, uh, is, is that way, right? Um, you, you basically want to, let's assume that you've got some sort of way of connecting to your network with a router. Uh, and so again, computer far away, maybe near the router, like in my case, right? You run a network connection from that to some switch or a fiber media converter, whatever it might be, right? Um, down to- Or just uh, a really long network cable if you just can. Just a really long network, network cable, it, whatever works, right? Ether, Ether, and, Ethernet and, works well up to a hundred yeah. meters. So yeah, I mean, unless it, it you does. have a really so, big house, a hundred meters is yeah, gonna you, probably- you don't, you don't need fiber, you know, you, some people have it in their walls and stuff. So a, a network cable works fine. Um, and then connect it to, again, you know, some sort of um, network audio transport. And those come in various sizes, shapes, and price points. And from there, you, you just connect an ether, a USB cable to your DAC. Um, so we've listed in the slide deck lots of these things that you can refer to, Harry. Um, uh, we've listed everything you need to do that. And you can kind of look at those decide for yourself what price point you want to kind of jump in at for those various devices. And those, those are far, that, those lists are far from comprehensive. Um, they're probably yeah. not even the best list, but they're there just to kind yeah. of give you an idea of, yeah. of, of, of makes and, and things that you could look at. Um, yeah. So definitely do some of your own research. Um, everybody in the group um, will have some experience with one or more of these. So I hope you'll leverage the club yep. and um, and all of us here, um, as well as uh, the resources that are available online to kind of figure out what makes the most sense. But yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, if, what I tell people is you probably already have a computer someplace that could serve as a music server. Maybe it's in your office or it's in the kitchen or someplace else. Maybe it's a computer that you leave on it's, or it's connected to your home theater so that you can watch you know, Netflix movies or whatever. You probably have a computer someplace in your house that's, that's up to the task of acting as a music server just in the background. Um, and that's fine. It just needs to be on your network and powered on when you want to play music. Uh, yeah. It doesn't need to be anything special. Com desktop computers tend to work a little bit better than laptops because of the whole power saving thing and all that kind of stuff. So I'll mention that, but you probably have a computer. So there's no reason to really go out and buy one. And then Connect, getting audio, digital audio, streaming audio into your system. You probably have a DAC in your system. If the DAC has a USB or SP diff input, you're in pretty good shape. Or if you've got an integrated amplifier that's got a digital input, um, a, lot of, a lot of those things do, um, then you're uh, in pretty good shape there as well. So you just need that network audio transport to take stuff off of your network from your music server and output it to a, a format that your DAC can accept, USB or SP diff or whatever, and, um, and then you're done. And, and I mean, really, I've literally built one that worked really well for $25 out of a Raspberry Pi. Um, okay, it was $35 with a micro SD card and a power supply. But um, to prove the concept, you know, how, how low can you go with this stuff? I mean, you can, you can start out really, really cheap, under $100 for sure, to be able to get something that functions surprisingly well. Um, yeah. And then kind of, you know, once you've done the proof of concept, then you can say, okay, uh, I see how this works now. Uh, now I can do some shopping and get something that's a little bit prettier. Uh, Kenny had a question about least noisy. And again, this we could have spent an entire evening talking about noise and all that. But I will say that most of the noise in a system like this is coming from the switch mode power supplies that power networking devices of, of all sorts, uh, as well as you know uh, consumer level streamers like a Logitech squeeze box, et cetera. You can go on Relia Pro. There's a link in the slide deck. And, and spend eleven dollars to buy a, a Relia Pro linear power supply wall wart for eleven bucks that will be much much cleaner and quieter than anything that you're using from a consumer audio generic device now, and that will make a notable difference. And then you can kind of go from there, Kenny. You can buy. There's links in the slide deck for small green computers sells for about one hundred and fifty bucks. 
a nice clean linear power supply that you could use to power your Mac mini, uh, your, um, your uh, network audio transport. Uh, if you had a NAS or something like that, you could power it with that. Uh, or if you're using fiber like me, you could power it for that, it, well, any of those things. But there's very affordable power supplies starting from about nine to $11 on up that will really help in terms of getting the noise level down. And you can go, you know, you can, you can go from there in terms of what you want to spend on power supplies. I would say that, you know, I use cheap power supplies upstream. Um, initially when I was getting going with this, Gregory remembers when I was getting going with this about 18 months ago. Uh, and then I use the more expensive linear power, power supplies at the destination end where it matters the most, like for powering my uptone ether regen. Um, so you can kind of do this in phases at various price points as you develop out your streaming system. Um, All right, we didn't mention Wi-Fi. We didn't mention Bluetooth. Um, you can do audio over those things. Um, Bluetooth is not going to be lossless, at least not yet. So Bluetooth is really more of a convenience thing. If you want to watch a YouTube video and, and get the audio to your system, Bluetooth can be kind of nice for that or out on the patio. Um, Wi-Fi um, is a bit perfect, but um, uh, Wi-Fi is hard to get um, you know, really, really performant. Um, especially for audio, um, I, I, I've had some luck with it, but I always tell people it's impossible so that they don't ask me questions later. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you can, you know, pay somebody to, to, you know, like a security system person to, you know, pay them a couple hundred bucks to pull an ethernet cable to your audio system, it'll pay you back and in, in saved frustration a hundred times over. Mm -hmm. Just, just do that. Don't, uh, you know, don't I wouldn't I wouldn't bother with Wi-Fi and, um, unless your landlord won't let you have networking and they won't let you have nice things. In which case, you, sh you should probably move. But um, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm being a little silly. But um, I hope that that point's not lost. 